Okay. So, uh, welcome to our first forum this year. Uh, please, can you hear me? Okay, sure. Uh, welcome to our first program this year. I am Eric Corbin, also known as Professor Sen. I am the founder of PCB Africa, and uh, PCB Africa seeks to promote our PCB design techniques. Uh, this, is, this would be our second year, and uh, we've been bringing to you quality training programs from high profile individuals in the industry, and today happens to be our first program for this year. So if, if you are part of this, then you should be proud of yourself because you get to experience the very first tutorial from Mr. Daniel Bika. Um, Mr. Daniel Bika has been very instrumental in our training programs. I think uh, he was the first speaker, and he has always been the first speaker every year on our training programs. He is noted for his science-based approach to PC based design. And uh, personally, it has been very, very useful to my PCB design career. I used to you know, design PCB just for the art of it, but since I met him and his, through his mentorship, I've done a lot. I've, I've actually improved a lot in my PCB design. So, for those who already have participate in our programs. He's not so a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer and a member of the IEEE EMC Society. Uh, this meeting I know is going to be great because uh, the one who is to speak is already great. So help me welcome Mr. Daniel Mika as he takes us through HDI via design, laying or planning the energy pipelines. Mr. Daniel Mika, please you're welcome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Obey. It's a really great honor to be continuing my uh, work with PCB Africa and all the wonderful things that you're doing to try to expand the expertise that you and I have been able to accomplish with uh, as many people as we can. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody who can please disable your uh, audio and hopefully you enjoyed the song. And uh, probably most of you want to disable your video as well. That might help all the interconnects after this. So I'm going to go to presentation mode and we can start this. If anybody has any questions, uh, please uh, jump in and, and uh, turn your audio on and stop me because we want to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about are going to be very basic. But uh, it's very important to have the right perspective on how things actually work. And that's been part of the problems that we've had. So, no further ado, I'm going to try to make this stuff work. See how much magic we can happen. All right. So, this is a class that I created last year because I saw so much of a need from my customers in uh, trying to manage this wonderful idea and technology of high density interconnects. And there are a lot of challenges and a lot of advantages, but what I saw was that uh, as my customers went into this technology, they already didn't have a really good understanding of how electromagnetic fields behave and because with HDI, you don't have the luxury of a drill plated conductor all the way through the board that there were issues both with the routing of signals, the routing of power, and more importantly, thermal because of the very big difference in the, the size of the vias and what was able to be done. So I start my classes with my disclaimer, because if you've taken any of my classes, there's going to be a number of slides and discussion that are going to be the same, because I'm going to go over and over again, just like I played the song over and over again, until 
you finally get to the understanding that I did working with Mr. Mor with Ralph Morrison, that it's a three dimensional puzzle and the energy travels in the space. So I, I also want to apologize to any real physicists in the audience. This is made as simply uh, described as I possibly can. I avoid, avoid the mathematics and just talk about simple behaviors. Just a quick note on me. This is my 42nd year with Motorola Freescale NXP, and I've been working with microprocessors and microcontrollers for most of my career the last 15 years or so because there was such a need for signal integrity and EMC specialists, and it was such a challenge for even the very large customers. I work with automotive OEMs and tier one, so billion dollar companies, and they were still struggling with being able to get their PC boards designed properly. Somebody please mute. And then since I've been working with Ralph Morrison, it's all become a lot easier for me to be able to, to do a design that overview of him. We lost him in 2019. Ralph, one of the early pioneers in signal integrity and EMC. And Ralph was a physicist by training. He had a bachelor of science in physics and then eventually got a master's of electrical engineering. But uh, he said that uh, throughout his career, he tried his best to connect the physics of how electronics actually worked to products. And uh, unfortunately, he said I was the first person who ever really listened to him. But uh, I, I want to encourage everybody to delve deeper into who he is. I created a, a website called RalphMorrison.com, where his his only recorded training seminar is available for pay per view. It's uh, fifty dollars to be able to access the files. It's three two hour seminars, and just to know the proceeds go to benefit his widow. So we're we're not trying to make money on this. We're trying to get the word out of all the the things Ralph was trying to teach us. In every lecture that Ralph did, he he talked about the space, and that's why I wrote the song. And he would end his lectures with this statement. Buildings have walls and halls. People travel in the halls, not the walls. Circuits have traces and spaces. Energy and signals travel in the spaces, not the traces. And this just sort of passed over me for many years, even though Ralph was doing his best to explain to me what this meant until I, unfortunately, until I was writing his eulogy, I, I didn't really understand how profound what he had tried to tell us was. All along, he was trying to tell people that this energy is not comprised of electrons moving in wires, but it's electromagnetic field that travels in space. Well, here's the words to my song. You'll be able to, to download the presentation later and you can sing the song to yourself and uh, be able to understand how physics actually behaves. So to move into this high density interconnections, that's what HDI stands for. And it's a various types of technologies in printed circuit board manufacturing. And what happens with an HDI idea is that you can make a connection between adjacent layers in the circuit board. And instead of the traditional method where you drill a hole through the board and then copper plate the uh, walls of that hole, and that connects to the various copper layers within the board stack, that with HDI, you uh, start with a, a a layer of copper, they do the etching so that they take away the parts of the copper that's not being needed for the um, for the board. And then they do a deposit of a, uh, they'll drill through the dielectric adjacent to it and then deposit some copper 
that will make a connection between two layers. So they're very, very small. They use a laser to drill the holes and you can get extremely high density connections and use very small traces, uh, which is very important now with these BGAs that are in production with pitch down below 0.4 uh, millimeters. So it's pretty, pretty important to use it, but it's what happens though is the idea of the Z axis transmission lines, which we'll get into in a little bit, is basically made even more difficult than it was with the through hole via. And so this is just a diagram I was able to find on the web that shows some of the different types of via technologies. The, the ones on the right are the full blown drilled and plated. One on the far right has got some type of fill that can either be a thermally conducted or some other type of material that you, you can pay to have done. Uh, to the left of that, those two through hole vias is a, what's called a blind via because it um, only goes through some of the inner layers and doesn't go all the way to the outside of the board. And each time these types of uh, technologies are applied to your circuit board, it basically costs you the same as in another layer pair. Every time you add a processing step, it costs more. So if you have a, a six layer board and you do blind vias in a few of those layers, it'll cost you the same as an eight layer board. So those are the kind of things that you want to see. And then again, these, these circled vias are the high density interconnect vias, and those are allow you to make connections between adjacent layers and then they can be put together in various topologies you can see where they're on the far left they're stacked on top of a buried via uh, the ones to the right there are staggered and those are ways of making the connection through multiple layers through the board stack this is basically the structure it's about 0.25 millimeters thick, depending on the dielectric that you happen to have. And then this shows the, the resulting shape. They drill a hole with a, um, a laser that goes through the dielectric material, the epoxy resin, and then they will plate on, on top of that. So that makes the connection between the layer on the top and the layer underneath. And this is just a little more uh, detail on this. I'm not going to go super deep into the actual manufacturing of the vias. Just wanted to try to present this information so you have it for your references. Because unfortunately, because of the, the smaller and smaller pitch that we're facing and the higher pin count, we're really going to end up being forced at some point in time to use uh, HDI. Your circuit boards. So these are the three different types where the one on the left is you've got they're staggered, so they're connected by copper on the layer that's between the, the two. They're stacked, then you can see how the, the hole is a little bit bigger on the second layer, and then you plate through and it connects both of those. And then we'll skip to when they use a larger drill that pokes the, all the way through multiple layers of dielectric. And then they plate that on top of it as you go through super small footprint. But those are ways to make fairly robust connections on the circuit board. So this is just uh, another thing from IPC that talks about, which is the the printed circuit committee that uh, creates all the rules and guidelines, and it it just determines what kinds of things you can do. Uh, especially one of the as things that are important is the aspect ratio of the through hole via because you have to be able to copper plate the inside of the of the drill hole and so depending on the thickness of the board it will re limit the uh, size of the via that you can use the, the thicker the board the larger the drill that has to be used because that's the only way you can be sure to get the copper to fill all the way through the inside and, and go up and down through these uh, 
sides of the thing. I'm going to see if I can't find a way to get a highlighter. There, laser pointer. So now can you guys see my laser pointer? I just forgot to turn that off. So this is the some of those things that you you face this normal plated through making connections on some of the inner layers. And then again, the micro via to show it, it's much smaller. You don't have the, the aspect ratio is, is not an issue because you're only going through one dielectric layer. And then this again shows the, the buried via that's inside. So there's a drill. Basically what happens is the, uh, you start with a uh, core and you will print plate print etch and plate that core and then they lay another laminate layer on each side because you balance this liquid uh, laminate on each side of the core lay some copper foil down and then at that point they would drill through these four layers and plate it and then do another lamination cycle with more dielectric and more copper to get to the six layer stack up and again each time you add a an activity where you're trying to do something to the circuit board you can expect that that will add the cost of another layer pair so as you get to be these more complicated structures and higher densities it it doesn't come for free it comes at a cost and this is another where there's where they've shown how you can take the, the blind vias and then uh, add the, the micro via technology, the HDI, to make the transitions from the stacked via, from the blind vias to other layers. So they have a lot of flexibility, but again, this comes at a cost. One is the, the thermal mass is smaller, and that you really have to start thinking about how you make your way from layer to layer and carry the field in a space that's well defined. And this is another example with all the different types. Here's the, the first place on the left is the, the staggered microvias. The one in the middle is, are the stacked microvias. Uh, the one on the right is the skipped microvia. The bottom left is where you've got a blind via with a microvia added to the outside. And then here's another stacked or uh, a skipped via there. And then here's a stacked all the way up. Just some of the ways that you can use the technology to, to create the conductors through the board stack. So this is one where you've got the microvias on top of each other. Um, you do one on each layer. This is the stack where there's the, the same size vias are put on top of each other. This is another, the step one. This is the microvias on a pad, so you've got a created a pad on one of the inner layers when you do that. You place a, a microvia on top of that. Not sure when you would want to do that, but and then here's another one where the microvia is on it, connecting to a, a layer below. So this is just for reference. I'm not going to try to explain how this all works. If you are involved in fabricating boards along this line, then I would, the best thing to do is there are some uh, training materials out there on the actual design and fabrication of microvia boards, and the IPC has a number of uh, app notes that you can work with as well. But you want to partner with your your fabricator to make sure that you understand what they need and what they can do. And they will be glad to work with you to try to find a way to implement this. And then here's the last one is where you just got all of them on top of each other. Uh, but each time you add a microvia, there's another step because you've got to drill a hole through the dielectric and then you've got a plate. So there's a, a lot of processing steps in this type of an application. Each layer pair requires a separate processing event which will include both. In this case, it would be the drill, or the, the uh, print, the etch, the drill, and then the plate. And that would have to happen in this case, you know, quite, enough, quite a few times. 
So now that's kind of just an overview of the, the via mechanical structures. Now we're going to really get into again the basic electronics and fields because this foundation, and this is a slide that I, I got from Ralph, is important because to understand what you need to do with this HDI technology, you really need to understand the behaviors of the physics of the uh, electromagnetic fields. But one thing I always do is I put up Maxwell's equations because if you think about it, Maxwell and Faraday and all of his those their peers were really working in a completely different world. Their instrumentation was limited, and they did an enormous amount of uh, thought in order to come up with some of these concepts. And and looking back into the, the world, these guys were really right, and they tried to tell us how things worked 100 years ago. And the electronics industry basically, I think a lot of it's driven because these equations are very scary. Uh, this is pretty heavy uh, calculus that most engineers don't want anything to do with it. And we as an industry have lost touch with the true nature of, of what we do for a living, which is to design systems that generate, manage, and consume electromagnetic fields. And this is important to, to have in your brain. You don't need to know the equations, but we do acknowledge that Maxwell is very smart, like I said, his peers. So the, the equations are about the interaction between electric and magnetic fields. They're not talking about electrons. They're not talking about holes. You know, the bottom line that Ralph finally got through my thick skull was if it was electrons, how would fields move through a space? The energy for radio, which everybody clearly acknowledges exists, travels through the air. It's the same energy, whether it's in the air or on a printed circuit board. And somehow we as an industry decided that just because the fields are moving on a circuit board, it magically changed from something that had to move through a space because an electromagnetic field cannot go through matter and that it moves through the space. But because we put it on the circuit board, it became electrons or holes or whatever the current um, thought was. And that part, for me, I feel sad because I embraced that approach for the first 30 years of my career. Until I met Ralph, I was a circuit guy and it was current flowing in wires. And that's got nothing to do with reality and caused the designs that I did, if they did work, to work by accident, not by design. And to talk about current, current is something flowing through a space. Um, if it's water, it's flowing through, you know, between the banks of the stream. Water's not moving in the banks, the water's moving between the banks. The same thing happens with electromagnetic field. The current doesn't flow in the wires. There is no current in the wires. There is no return current, which is one of the scary things that we have to start letting go of. It goes from where there is field stored to where there is not field. Flows just like water flowing driven by gravity. Field energy goes from a point of higher concentration where the field density or voltage is higher to a place that's been connected to that space that has a lower field density or voltage. It tries to reach equilibrium just the same as the water flows downstream in a river. It's exactly the same behavior. If you don't have place that directs the flow of the energy, it goes everywhere, just like if a, a river rises up over its banks and then you've got a, a lot of area that's, a, that's flat, the river will spread out all over the place, flooding homes and all the fun stuff that's been happening around the world right now. The field does the same thing. When you don't control where, it is, where it's going, the field 
goes everywhere. And that's where we have a lot of trouble with our systems. That's where EMI becomes a problem and signal integrity becomes a problem. One of the things I was able to derive from Ralph's teachings was these rules of the triplets that uh, was how can we understand behaviors of fields in simple terms? So it turns out that it's 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 extremely simple. To contain electromagnetic field, you only need three things: two conductors separated by a space. A capacitor is a great example of this. A capacitor is two sets of plates separated by some type of a dielectric, and you can store field energy in that space. We only have three components to use in the development of our products. You get a conductor, you get the space, and there are switches. That's it. There's nothing else in the universe. The most complicated, highest performance microprocessor is a giant switch array and you turn on and off these switches to allow field to go from one place to the next. It's just that simple. And then you can only do three things with field energy. You can store it, you can move it, or you can convert it to kinetic energy. That's it. Drive a speaker, turn a motor, cause the molecules in a filament and a light bulb to vibrate so that you get light, there's nothing else. This is not rocket science. It's extremely simple. And the rules need to be driven by this simple perspective of how you put together your systems. We aren't talking in any of these things about electrons moving in wires. So really simple perspective here. I have my three elements to store field on the left. We have conductor, a space, and a conductor. And one of the things you have to start realizing in your system design is two of the components of your system are predefined and have to be always the same. You have a continuous conductor which connects to where the power supply comes onto the board to wherever you're using the field energy. That's ground. It cannot be broken. There's one ground, one conductor that supports ground. We typically will use a plane because it makes things a lot simpler. Next to that continuous conductor has to be a continuous dielectric because the field has to move in a space. The only thing left to design in the system is the switched conductor. And that lets you take field from the left side of this diagram to the right side as the, field, the switch starts to close. And it's very simple behavior. As the switch starts to go from off to on, and this is kind of a semiconductor because they're never ever really all the way off and they're never really all the way on, but as the switch starts to close, the field now can see that there's a space next to it that doesn't have the same field density and it desperately wants to get to zero. So it starts to move into this new space. So that's important to note. It doesn't have any idea what's at the other end. It moves from the left to the right, just like water through a garden hose. When you turn on the faucet and the water starts to flow, it doesn't jump to the other end of the hose. It takes time for that water to move. The same thing is true for electromagnetic field. It sees this new space and starts to move into it. And it goes until it hits the other end. And the other thing is that basically when you turn on a switch, if it's like there's a short circuit because every single bit of field energy that can possibly travel through this dielectric is going to do so. So its maximum flow is going to be from left to right. And it doesn't know anything about what's at the other end because it hasn't gotten there yet. Now, is there something happening to the poor electrons in the conductors? 
and in the dielectric, yes. This evil mean field is going to push around not only the molecules in the conductors and in the dielectric, so some of the energy is going to be lost as it's converted into kinetic energy. That's your voltage drop. It's going to cause some of the electrons in the outer valence regions to be displaced and cause them to move a little bit. So you're going to have a few electrons going in one way in, on one conductor and the other way on the other conductor. But they're moving extremely slow. Um, the energy itself is moving at the speed of light. The, uh, the electrons are moving at some, you know, inches per nanosecond. I, I can't remember the exact number, but but they're just barely moving at all. The field is zooming along at the speed of light through the dielectric, which is roughly a, a half six inches per nanosecond during that. When I, when I open the switch, the field on the left can't see the space on the right anymore, so it's happy again. It doesn't want to move because it doesn't see a place to go. And then the energy that passed through is on the right hand side here will continue to move depending on what's at the other end. If there's another switch, then that field will move into another space. If there's a, a load of some sort, then that field energy will be consumed either uh, again connect. Can, it will be uh, converted to kinetic energy if you're driving a motor or turning on a light bulb, mm -hmm. but it, it has to do that as well. Can everybody please mute your, your microphones? Well, I want to look at the discrete components a little bit because this is something that is causing a lot of headaches that people don't know about. A resistor is used to replace a section of the signal trace power supply or whatever you're using it for. Underneath the resistor, because this is replacing a piece of trace, route under there, so no other traces going across that space between the resistor leads. You don't want to put ground flood under there, nothing, because the job of the resistor is to interact with the field that's traveling in the dielectric directly next to it. So as the field moves from left to right past the resistor, some of the field energy is going to interact with the molecules of the resistor. It's designed specifically to heat up. It's going to be converting electromagnetic field into kinetic energy. <clears throat> and you will, if you have five volts on the left and three volts on the right, it's because two volts of field has been changed into heat. You say you can only do three things with field. You can store it, you can move it, or you can convert it to kinetic energy. In order to make sure that these components are giving you their best work, you have to make sure that you show them the space where the field's moving. So this is one way to improve your designs without having to spend money. In fact, I encourage all of you when you're putting together your libraries for components that under discrete, you create a keep out area so you can't allow the flood if you're doing ground floods or you can't route underneath these components unless you absolutely do it on purpose. But you have to know that you're going to do that kind of thing at a penalty. It's going to reduce the efficiency of the resistor in this case, working with the field in the dielectric, and it's going to cause some cost talk or some interaction between fields that could indeed make your design fail EMC. A diode is another cool component. It's designed so that it actually resists the movement of the electrons. So you've got this semiconductor structure that prevents the field from moving because it interferes with this little bit of flow of electrons that are happening as the field moves by. So in one direction, the diode allows the energy to move, but 
the same thing happens to the diode as with the resistor. Some of the field energy is going to interact with the molecules in the diode and be converted into heat. This is the famous 0.7 volt uh, drop that you have through uh, diodes. It, it doesn't magically block 0.7 volts. It consumes 0.7 volts. So that's something you want to start recalibrating your thinking about is what these components are actually doing. The resistor doesn't magically block voltage. The resistor eats it. The diode doesn't magically allow some energy to travel. It eats some of it. And if the diode is in the other direction, then it blocks the flow of field and you get some type of a, a directional control. Now, of course, semiconductors are not perfect, so it doesn't block all. There's always going to be some leakage current that will happen. There'll be some field seen on the other side, but it, most of it's going to be blocked. A capacitor is another wonderful component. It's two conductors separated by a dielectric that has a capacity for storing a large amount of field. A dielectric constant of a capacitor is something in the order of 20 or 30,000. When the dielectric on a printed circuit board is four, air is 1.1, I think, or something like that. And space is a dielectric constant of one. So what happens is as the field moves into the space, the, the capacitor is designed to provide a parallel space to the dielectric on the circuit board. Again, you need to expose the body of the capacitor to the dielectric directly underneath it so that it can have the best interaction with the field and it will fill this space up energy before it moves further downstream. So if you have a capacitor in series with the power supply, <clears throat> when you turn on the power, it moves through the dielectric connecting the power conductor to the capacitor. Then it has to fill the capacitor up because the capacitor presents a lower impedance space. The field wants to go either to where the voltage is lower or the impedance is lower. The impedance is the capacity of a space to store energy. So uh, the impedance of a ceramic capacitor is around 10 milliohms. So the printed circuit board, you might have impedances, you know, 50 or 40 ohms, depending on what. So the, the field really wants to go into the capacitor and it does that first. And once it gets to equilibrium, with the dielectric in the circuit board and the dielectric in the capacitor, then it will start to fill the space off further downstream. It's like if you've got a river and a hole. It has to fill the hole first, and then the river can go past it. So if you've got a, a, a river, a lake, and then a river going out of the lake, the lake has to be filled before the water goes past it. Field does the same thing. It's really easy to understand. And that way you can use these components more effectively. <clears throat> so all these are things that you use to replace sections of the trace, and you have to make sure that their bodies are connected to the dielectric, because that's where the energy is, and that's what you want them to be interacting with. Another thing about capacitors, we talk about bypass capacitors and filter capacitors. A capacitor just provides a space that has a lower impedance than what's on the circuit board, and the energy has to go into the capacitor before it can go anywhere else. This is especially important when you're using it to protect your circuit board. You want to put on any wire coming from the outside world, you want to put a, a small package capacitor as close to the connector as you can. And what its job is, is when you have noise impulses of energy on the wiring harness, that it sees the capacitor first. That capacitor presents an extremely low impedance compared to the wiring harness or the circuit board. That impulse of field will go into the capacitor, and then the capacitor will slowly release it back out into the world. <clears throat> 
so that you keep that voltage circuit board. So when you're designing your protection circuit, a lot of times people use um, transient suppressors or reverse battery diodes or common mode chokes. The first component in that series of and on your circuit board needs to be the capacitor because it doesn't consume very much energy, but it catches and releases it. Transient suppressor has to convert some of that energy into heat. If you have a 50 volt spike on a, a normally 12 volt line and you have a transient suppressor there, it has to eat the 48, the 38 volts. You know, it's it's just not magically going away. It doesn't shunt the energy. It has to convert it into heat. And you're consuming energy and heating up components eventually causes damage. So the first thing you want to have on your circuit board should be a capacitor because it's least uh, affected by the field going into and out of the structure. Just a little note on how to improve your boards as well. This is the bottom line we have to remember. We're involved in developing products which generate, control, and consume electromagnetic field energy. Circuit theory talks about current flow and conductors, and it makes you think that it's electrons moving into conductors. When you turn on a switch, it adds a conductor and current flows in a loop. The wires carry the energy and the load instantly affects the flow of energy. It's not right. Switches add a new space and the field now travels from where it was until the switch was turned on to the new space. You turn on the faucet, the water moves into the hose and it takes time for it to move. It only, Even though it's the speed of light, it's still only six inches per nanosecond. And that's really pretty slow when you start to look at the requirements for these new systems. We've got ICs now with two nanometers transistors that are switching in single digit femtoseconds. And if worrying about how long it takes for energy to move becomes a big problem, especially in the case of the, uh, the power supplies. How do you bring energy into something that needs power in something, some a 20th wavelength at 100 gigahertz? These are real challenges that are posed to us as we're trying to use today's technology. But the current flow again is not the electrons moving in the wire, it's the electromagnetic field moving through that space. And that's not what I was taught, that's not what I used for the first 25 plus years of my career. And again, I found out after my first class with Rick Hartley, that every design I ever did only worked by accident, not by design. And I needed to understand how fields work and how do I manage the fields. So again, that's why I wrote the song. Hopefully you're brainwashed enough that you will wake up in the middle of the night screaming. It's all about the space. So fields are what we commonly think of as electricity. It's electromagnetic field. Whether it's the wiring in your house or the traces on a circuit board, the field travels between a pair of conductors, hopefully, that you've designed on purpose. And it takes time for these things to move. But as the field moves, unless you're dealing with superconductors, there is going to be some interaction between the field and the molecules. This is going to cause, because you've got the, the electric field is pushing against the outer valence electrons of all these molecules, and that energy gets converted from electromagnetic field into kinetic energy. That's where voltage drop comes from, that you're converting some of the field into heat. And it's not some magic change in the voltage. The uh, conductor and the dielectric all are eating some of the field. Unless, of course, it's in vacuum. And the other thing is that 
field energy seems to move slower through the dielectrics than it does in space. Well, that's back to the bottom line. Energy cannot go through matter. So electromagnetic energy travels in space at the speed of light because light is electromagnetic field energy. Once you get into the atmosphere, it slows down its effective velocity because it can't go through the molecules in the air. It has to go around them. So to go from point A to point B takes longer because the, tra the travel is around all the molecules in that space. When you get to a printed circuit board, the molecular density again is much higher. So it's still traveling at the speed of light, but it has to go around even more molecules. So it takes it longer to go from one place to the other. But again, the velocity of the waves themselves is constant. It's always the speed of light. So fields have a very predictable behavior based on some of the concepts we've just discussed. If I've got a sphere that's completely closed and in the middle of the sphere is another conductor and I have charge stored in that space, this charge will be between the outer surface of the inner conductor and the inner surface of the outer conductor. And there will be a charge in that space. It won't go anywhere because there's nowhere for it to go. It's contained. So on the outer surface of the sphere, there is no charge related to the field that's stored inside. Because for field to be managed, you need three things, two conductors separated by a space. So I can store in the sphere because I've got two conductors separated by a space. But the field can't go out to the outside of the sphere because there's no hole. It can't go through the conductor. That's an important thing to remember. Fields don't go through matter. They go around it. If there's no hole, because this is a, a tight crystal lattice in a conductor, copper, gold, whatever you're using, it can't make its way through that structure. Same thing in a coaxial cable. It works because you've got a conductor on well, outside the shield and a center conductor and the field is inside of that space between the outer surface of the inner conductor and the inner surface of the shield. If I've got my sphere and there's a hole in it, and there's another conductor somewhere, then that point, the field can see the other conductor and it will move into this space. Because now I've got, again, my requirements. I've got two conductors separated by a space. Once I open up the sphere, then the field can now see outside. And if there's another conductor, it will want to fill that space. And it will, the law basically says between every pair of conductors, there will be shared field. So between these two conductors, there's shared field. Between the conductor inside the sphere and a wire in the wall, there will be shared speed field. Between that conductor and an airplane flying over, there will be shared field. The only reason anything works at all, because we don't have containment for our fields, is the magnitude of this field shared is reduced by the square of the distance. So if something's twice as far away, there's one fourth of the voltage that's shared. And we take this to a circuit board. I was always taught in the beginning that you can't route high speed digital signals on the area where you've got sensitive analog. So I, would, I wouldn't be able to route them on opposite sides of the plane. So the way it works though, <clears throat> is that the field traveling related to this signal trace is gonna be in the shadow of the trace. So the bottom of the trace and the top of the plane. That's where most of the energy is going to be. The same thing for this one. If there's a trace on the other side of this plane, 
the field doesn't magically go through the plane. So I can put a clock on the top and I can put an A to D signal on the next layer below the plane and they will be just happy and fine. There is no way for the field to get through the plane unless I put a hole there and add another conductor. And some of this is one of the rules that were that fell out of our not understanding things is that we didn't provide unique spaces for every signal. Therefore, when we had a digital clock signal and we had an analog signal, if they didn't have a unique space, then there was the opportunity for them to interact because they were forced to find their way back to the continuous conductor when we talked about that already. And there would be sharing the same space and there would be an issue. Now, it isn't completely true in the case of a plane because a circuit board has a finite size and some of the field will make its way all the way around the edge of the tray, the circuit board and back into the next layer and find the conductor on the third layer. Because the law says between any and every pair of conductors, there will be shared space. The good news is it's about 200 dB from the top of the plane to the bottom of the plane. So that's how it works. The other thing I want to take just a moment to talk about is what the nature of crosstalk really is. So as I've got a changing electric field in the space between the trace and the plane, it creates a changing magnetic field. And that magnetic field is concentrated around the signal trace. The same amount of magnetic field is being created around the plane, but because the plane is so much larger, the flux density is, is orders of many, many orders of magnitudes lower as it interacts with the plane. But I will be creating a changing magnetic field related to the moving E field on the signal. This changing magnetic field will cause a changing electric field in the space next to the trace. That changing electric field. Je n'ai pas du tout pensé, en fait. Euh, moi, souvent, c'est. Euh... Somebody needs to mute their phone. So the changing electric field will cause a changing magnetic field in the next trace. That changing magnetic field will affect the E field that's in the space between that trace and the ground plane. So that's how crosstalk works. You've got a changing electric field on the wavefront. It causes a changing magnetic field in the conductor. That the trace conductor magnetic field causes a changing electric field in the adjacent space. And then when it finds another conductor, it will increase, cause a changing magnetic field, and it just walks its way through the board. So crosstalk isn't magic either. It's just a simple behavior of the E and the H fields flip-flopping back and forth. And it only happens at a wavefront where you've got a changing field because a, a static field doesn't cause any damage. It has a, a continuous E field and a continuous H field, and it's not changing. So the changing is where it happens. That's how generators work. That's how motors work. Uh, uh, generators where you have a moving uh, uh, conductor through a magnetic field. Motors where you cause a moving magnetic field to push the motor. Very simple stuff. Uh, generators and motors are just a real extreme cross. We depend on it. The good transmission lines, transmission lines are any pair of conductors. It's not, uh, sometimes people get hung up on the idea of a controlled impedance transmission line. You want to have a dedicated transmission line for every signal and every power supply on your circuit board. That's the signal conductor, the trace, one dielectric away from ground, so that you have a space that this field can call its own. That provides the lowest impedance path for this energy, and it will tend to stay in the space that you create. Since we don't have coaxial interconnections on the circuit boards, we've always got the issue that we saw before. There will be some crosstalk because the field is not completely contained. 
and it desperately wants to say hi to every conductor around it. It's just like a, a baby that likes to see everybody, and waves and smiles. So the field will follow the conductors because having a contained space makes it a smaller space, so the impedance of that space is lower. Once you get in, free space is 377 ohms. So if you go from the conductors that are completely opposite, I don't know if you can see my arms, but if, you, if you're at 180 degrees off, then you've got the whole of space next to it. But as you start to move those conductors closer together, the volume of that space is reduced and it takes less field to achieve a voltage in that space as it gets smaller and smaller. So you can control where the field goes by managing the uh, transmission lines and presenting places where not only does the voltage see a lower potential, but also sees a lower impedance so that we'll be able to move from where it is to where you want it to be. So again, every conductor pair is a transmission line. And it can be a trace to trace or trace to plane. There will be field between those. The idea of a good circuit board design is that you make it so that it's all of your signals have a defined transmission line to move through that they prefer to any other place. And we always have some crossed off and some escaping field because we don't get coax. But again, you're saved by the square of the distance rule. The farther apart they are, the less interaction there is. The key though is still, the traces must be one dielectric away from the return. Ideally, the next layer is a, is a ground plane. If you can't have to have the continuous conductor and the continuous dielectric, all you get to play with is the switched conductor. In some cases, you're forced to use coplanar ground traces. You have a three, four layer board and layer two is ground. One and three are just fine. They're next to layer two. Layer four is not next to the ground plane. It is two dielectrics and a conductor layer away from the ground plane. And so any signals that you route on layer four need to have coplanar ground copper. So you route a signal trace next to a ground trace in order to create the transmission line for your signals. The only time you need to worry about control impedance is if the driver and the receiver are farther apart than um, a quarter wave wavelength is the absolute maximum. But I use a sixth wavelength for my design so that there's some flexibility with component placement. And the idea is that you want to make sure that you don't have uh, ringing happening because of the distance between the driver and the receiver. On most times their board, if the continuity is less than a sixth of, of a wavelength, then it basically is in, in, invisible to the signal. You can have small discontinuities that won't affect your signal integrity or EMC in most cases, but you need to be aware of how fast the transistors that you're using are switching because that's what the wave front is driven by. It's not the frequency of your clock or the frequency of your data. It's the switching speed of the transistor that determines the needs of that transmission line. And the, the thing that we're going to get into now that's a big problem in through hole boards, traditional drills, is the Z axis. Vertical transitions are just as important as horizontal transitions. An awful lot of the MC failures that I work on are because of the lack of ground transition vias and the control of the fields as they move through the board stack. This is where we're slowly getting to where the HDI design guidelines become more and more important. When you have signals in a ground plane, this is a Rick Hartley slide, by the way. If I've got a trace on layer one and I want to route it to layer two, I mean to layer three, layer two is a ground plane. There's a hole that has to be drilled through the ground plane 
to get the signal. So what I have maintained is I've got the space between the signal and the ground plane. Then I've got the space between the wall of the signal via and the ground plane. And then I've got the space between the signal trace and the ground plane. So I've kept my connection with the continuous conductor and the continuous dielectric, and I move my switch conductor where it needs to go. I have never broken the transmission line. If it's a six layer board and two and five are ground, if I want to route from one to six or one to four, I have to put a ground transition via to connect the copper on two to the copper on five. That's the only way I can create a continuous conductor and connect the continuous dielectric and then be able to route the signal trace. This is critical. You need to be aware of the dielectric that your signal is traveling in and the dielectric you want to move it to and how do you connect the two conductors involved in managing that field from dielectric at the, on one part of the board to the dielectric in the other. And that's going to need two continuous pieces of copper. You're going to need to connect the grounds together and you're going to need to connect the signals together with a common space between them and nothing else routed in that space. So you've got to see three dimensions. It's plumbing and you need to make sure that you don't break that one dielectric rule for signals on your circuit board. And it's even more important for power supplies. You absolutely have to present that body of that capacitor with a clean pipe to the switches, the IC. See, lots of failures in IC uh, power supply design where they connect the capacitors on one side of the board to the switching power supply on the top side of the board with one great big power via or a blob of power vias with no concept of where the ground via is that's going to take the energy from the dielectric on the top of the board to the dielectric on the bottom of the board. And then they go on an inner layer to route from the power supply to the IC and they don't connect to that uh, conductor with so that the dielectrics are connected either. So you end up with all these big discontinuities, high impedance nodes that restrict the flow of energy because the idea of providing discrete spaces for energy to move in isn't uh, followed. That rule gets broken and you have problems with signal integrity and with EMC. So the energy moves in the space between the conductor. It cannot go through anything. So the one energy to go places, you have to provide the two conductors that you use to direct the field. It's easy. One of them has to be ground. Next to ground has to be the continuous conductor or dielectric. And all that's left to design is the switched conductor that goes from the power supply input to the voltage regulator and the output of the voltage regulator to the IC, to the IC pins, to whatever you're doing, that's the switch conductor. And it just needs to always be next to the continuous truck conductor or ground. If it's on an adjacent layer, it's easy. But if you have to drive it into another layer, you're going to have to make sure you take both conductors through the board. Does it magically go there? It goes to, it will find the nearest ground. And if it's someplace bad, it's because you let it do that. But that's the basic field approach. Hopefully this makes sense. It, it's changed the way my boards work. Everything that I work on, we have first pass compliance. We manage these fields properly. We manage the power supplies properly and the boards work when we turn them on, as long as I get the schematic right. But that's the idea. Is you want to be able to understand that you're controlling fields. So it's already a difficult problem for through holes. 
With high density interconnects, it's worse because you don't have that forced connection through the board stack of a drilled and plated conductor. So my wires are no longer through the whole board. They only go part of the way through the board and they're a lot smaller. So we're going to try to get into this part now. The advantages are great. The surface area is smaller. You can significantly increase your routing density. And done properly, it can actually be a cost that's on par with traditional drill designs. A lot of times you can see where you might be able to reduce the number of layers, which is how you achieve the cost bar. You can support smaller pitch ICs, so you can you know, do the 0.4 pitch and smaller stuff. And then um, you have a lot more control over where the vias are because a laser doesn't wiggle around like a drill does. A mechanical drill has some drift and you have to make sure that in your design that you have enough uh, space for a wobbly drill to go through the board step. Those are some of the advantages and done properly, HDI can be a wonderful thing. The problems are about the surface area is smaller and the total mass for these are smaller. So when you're looking at the behavior of a through hole via, when it comes to transmitting heat, it's, it's way less. It's uh, about a third or less of the capability of a drilled via. So that's something to worry about. I've had a number of applications where they didn't take that into effect and into consideration, and their, their processors were overheating because they were not connecting the BGA to the ground planes, which were traditionally used to dissipate the heat with enough thermal mass. So, so it didn't have anywhere to go. It, it's a smaller structure. It carries a lot less kinetic energy, and therefore they ended up with problems. The other thing is you don't have an automatic opening in a ground plane. You don't drill through the, the board and then only plate part of it. The ground plane um, is a barrier. So if you want field to go next to a, a ground via down the board stack, you have to create the hole. Because fields don't go through metal. They go around the metal. So this is where it starts to get to be a little tougher. Again, the thermal dissipation is lower, makes creating those Z-axis transition line, transmission lines extremely difficult. And you, again, you've got to know which dielectric you're starting from and which dielectric you want to go to and make sure that you create the Z-axis dielectric transmission line to connect that those two different layers of the board. And then you need to also know what your target thermal resistance needs to be to allow your, uh, your dye temperatures to be kept at a, an acceptable lay, level. This is all a lot harder than it is with through hole vias. We're going to look at how do we do the layer to layer interconnects. And this is where you can take these diagrams and use them as your your uh, guidelines for designing the different board stacks with high density interconnects. And this is what I, I created because my customers were having such a difficult time. You typically would not see HDI in a four layer board, so I skipped over that. You may find reasons to use it in a six layer board, probably driven by very high density BGAs with very small pitch. So what I did here is I created, here's your six layer board stack. Layers two and five are ground. This by the way is my favorite board stack because layer one, two and three have paired dielectrics. That's a triplet. It's all about threes, right? Four, five and six is another dielectric pair because the dielectric again between four and five is automatically connected between five and six when you route from four to six. So you don't need ground transition vias in those cases. But when you go from one or three to four or six, you have to have a ground transition via that connects the ground on two to the ground on five. So this is what this table shows. 
One to three is clean. Four or six is clean. That's over here. And then, but if I go from one or three to 406, I need a ground transition via to go from two to five. Same thing going the other way. I need a ground transition from two to five. Because I need, I got to be aware of where the dielectric is. I'm going from here to here. I'm okay. But if I'm going to here to here, I've got to have the connection between the ground plane on two to the ground plane on four. I mean, five rather. And this is kind of how it looks. Layer one to two and two to three, we saw this diagram. These di dielectrics are automatically connected. You punch a hole through there, you connect those two, and all's good. Same thing on the bottom of the board. They're automatically connected when you make those. But when I go from one or two or one to the one or three to four or five, I have to make sure that there's a ground transition via next to the signal. And in HDI, these are you have to make a, a stack, you know, because there's going to be two more layers in here. And so I've got to make a hole through layer full three and a hole through layer four to connect the ground between two and five. And then I've got to connect one through the board stack to keep this dielectric. So I'm connecting the dielectric on the top of the board stack through the via pair to the bottom of the board stack. An eight layer board, one of my least favorite board stacks because typically people aren't allowed to do what I have shown in this one, which is to have three ground planes. They want to try to route this with two ground planes, which means that you've got two layers that are not next to ground, and those are orphan layers, and you have to route them with coplanar ground traces in order to make sure that you have transmission lines on all the layers. But in this case, I've added an extra ground plane, and I put it in the middle of the board stack, and I've got you know places for the signals to go. Uh, I could have switched maybe the power and signal, um, but this is the idea is that every layer is still adjacent to a ground plane. So automatically good transmission lines, the same rule goes between one and three. I don't need a ground transition via. When I route from one or three to four, I've got to connect layer two to layer five. When I route from layer one or three to layer six or eight, I've got to put a ground transition via all the way from layer two to layer seven. And this is you've got to be aware of the dielectric that you're using on the start of the signal to, and where you're trying to take it to. Same thing over here when we want to go back up the board stack. You've got to make sure you know what dielectric you're starting from and how do you make the connection with both conductors, not just the signal, but the ground to the right place so that you don't break that one dielectric rule. Well, again, the way this board stack works between one and three, we get the automatic paired dielectrics. Between uh, six and eight, we get the automatic paired dielectrics. It starts to get a little wonky when we go on the inner side, but when I go from one or three to six or eight, I just need a ground transition via to connect the ground on two to the ground on seven. And it kind of looks like this. Is that when I want to go from one or two. To uh, four and five, I need to make sure that the ground is connected to five from the two and then the signal via goes from three to four because the energy is traveling in this space and I want it to travel in this space. I have to make sure this vertical pipe is there. If you have a water faucet in your basement and you have a sink upstairs and you turn the faucet on and there's no pipe, the water will eventually get upstairs, but you're not going to like what happens. Same thing with fields. If you don't give it a defined space 
it will find a way to get from here to there, but it won't be where you want it to be, and it is most definitely going to cause issues. It'll be at minimum an impedance discontinuity, and most likely it's going to cause signal integrity and radiator emissions problems. Same thing when I go from one to four, I still have to connect the ground on two to the ground on five so that this plumbing isn't broken. Hopefully this is starting to make sense. I've got to think in three dimensions now. I'm not very good at drawing three dimensional pictures, so sorry about that. And here we're going, I want to go from layer four to layer eight. So the energy is traveling in the space between four and five. I need to get to the space between seven and eight. So I have to not just connect the signal, and these are simulated HDI stacks. I have to connect the ground as well and keep this space open. I want to go from four to six, the same thing. I still have to make sure I connect layer five to layer seven and keep this pathway intact. The plumbing can't be broken. If you have a discontinuity in your piping in your house, water goes places you don't want it to go. Yields are just as evil. 12 layer board is another good one. I like board stacks that are even multiples of three because then I can use ground planes in each of the triplets. So I got a ground on two, five, eight, and 11. I've got four sets of paired dielectrics and those layers take care of themselves. I just have to worry about how do I get from each of those paired dielectrics to the adjacent pair, wherever I want it to go. So if I'm going from one or three to four or six, I need a ground transition via between layer two and layer five. If I want to go from one or three to seven or nine, I need a ground transition via stack between layers two to eight. If I want to go to the bottom of the board, now I need to be able to have a via a stack to connect ground from two all the way down to 11. And this is important, even if you're doing blind via boards, you, you've got to make sure you understand the dielectric, where the energy is starting from and where you want it to go and how you're going to get there. And you have to show it how to get there. You've got to keep the ground continuous, the adjacent dielectric continuous, and then your switch conductor is the one you use to take the energy from where it was to where you want it to be. Back to the same thing. You've got paired dielectrics between one and three, four and six, seven and nine, 10 and 12. So those are solid foundations for your board where if you maintain those transitions from between those layer pairs that you don't have to do anything magic. But when you start to connect between them, if I go between any of the triplets, I've got to make sure that I connect the ground planes from the one that I'm starting with, whether this is one and two or this is four and five, whatever the stack up is, I need to make sure that I make the grounds connected so that I keep this pipeline intact. And this is the next one is between one and three. So between any of the layer triplets, I just need to make sure that I connect the ground. And that's what that chart's intended to show you. Here's a 12 layer stack with five ground planes. Uh, it's powerful in that I have um, power layers adjacent to ground planes. And this is where you have these new BGAs that require a significant amount of energy, 10, 20, 30 amps, you have to connect them with dielectrics that are sufficient to do that. Uh, quite often, it's, it's better to use parallel dielectrics than to try to use wider traces. And just another note, the traditional way of dealing with higher current has been to increase copper weight or add more power vias. And the simulation tools will lead you to believe that that works. And if you're trying to meet an impedance target using any 
of the commercial power distribution system simulation tools, it will lie to you. It doesn't know how to tell the difference between a good transmission line and a bad one. It will let you use a board stack where your power supplies are two or three layers away from ground. And in order to make it past the impedance target that you're trying to design for, if you if you add more power copper, go from half ounce to two ounce, for example, and suddenly it magically looks like it's going to work. Going to two ounce copper hasn't increased the energy capacity of the dielectric. The energy doesn't flow in the copper. The energy flows in the space. So if you want to increase your capacity, you reduce the impedance. And there's two ways to do that. You can, or three ways to do that. You can use a wider conductor. I use fairly wide copper cores to connect my PMIC on inner layers to my ICs. That helps. You can reduce the thickness of the dielectric, which has an even higher impact on impedance. Or what's really easy, because you don't usually have the luxury of changing the dielectric thickness to match the power requirements, is use parallel dielectrics. So I will put power on two sides of ground. And those two dielectrics will then be shared. So if I've got, you know, a, a 250 ohm lines in parallel is 25 ohms. So if I've got a nice wide piece of copper that's probably half an inch and I've got an impedance of about you know 20 ohms of one, if I need a lot more energy, then I'll duplicate that on an adjacent layer next to the ground plane. And now I've got 10 ohms. And those are the ways to manage the plumbing. But to get there, you still have to be concerned with how do I go from the dielectric where the power supply is located to the layer that I'm going to use to connect to the BGA? That's where the z-axis becomes an important feature too. You can't just have a big blob of power vias or a bunch of big fat power vias and not have increased the number of dielectrics you're using. So I use for power transitions between layers what I call a checkerboard or it's a, a, a waterfall. So I will checkerboard power and ground vias uh, similar to what a number of new BGAs are starting to show that for their core connection. So in order to provide multiple parallel Z-axis transmission lines, a, a traditional drill via is roughly 50 ohms of via pair. HDI, you can get even lower than that. You can get you know 15 or 20 ohms in a stack via pair. Um, in order to connect these dielectrics, but you will need multiples in order to get this higher current. And we haven't even started talking about what's the mechanical issue that you have trying to keep it from overheating. But again, this is the same thing. This chart will let you know if I want to go from dielectric between one and two, what does it take to get to the other layers? Uh, I need to have um, ground transition vias between two and four to get to five or seven. If I want to get, to, or because um, five is referenced only to six in this case, and I want to get down to seven or eight, I've got to put ground transition vias again to do this work. Here's again, the, the paired dielectrics are automatic. So from one or one to three, you've got a hole, you've got a continuous transmission line. Uh, five to seven, you've got a continuous transmission line. 10 to 12 continuous transmission line. You just have to make sure when you go between those triplets, you continue to remember that you have to have these Z axis transmission lines just the same as the horizontal ones. And this is again, I'm going to go from three to eight. I've got to connect the ground on two to the ground on nine so that I keep this plumbing intact. I want to go to one to eight. I've got to keep the ground connected. So from two to nine, and then I have my plumbing for the field to move through the board stack. And if this is going to be a power supply, I would need to have multiple parallel paths in the Z axis in order to make sure that I have plenty of capacity 
to move the energy from one dielectric to another one through the board stack. So hopefully this is re repetitive enough that you'll start to have it broken into your into your brains for your process. So here, if I want to go from eight to 12, I've got to connect the ground from nine to 11, and then I've got my intact powers, my connection here. So the fields have a place to go that I've controlled. Again, from one to 10, same thing. I've got to be able to put together all the parts you need to have. Again, two conductors separated by a dielectric. And in the case of electronic system design, you have a continuous conductor, the ground, and you have the switch conductor, and the dielectric fits between them. Always has to be the same. You have to be able to look from the switch all the way back to the power supply and see a continuous dielectric bounded by two continuous conductors. So when all the switches are turned on, you have to look back in to the power supply, and there needs to be a path that looks like this, all the way from the switch to the source of the energy. If you can't see an unbroken dielectric bounded by the unbroken uh, conductor and the switch conductor, you have a problem. There will be issues with signal integrity. There will be issues with EMC. You have to be able to see that. Here's just another going from one to three. I've got to connect the ground plane on two to the ground plane on four in order to provide this the energy flow for these things. If I want to go to one, from one to three is simple. If I want to go from one to five, I've got to have a ground transition. I want to go from three to from uh, one to five, again, I've got to have ground transition. It gets a little hairy when you're trying to draw all these, but hopefully you get the idea. So we're going to talk now. You hopefully have gotten a pretty good feel for the challenges of HDI and providing Z-axis transmission lines for power and signals. Now we've got the other challenge, the fact that the HDI vias are extremely small, so the connection between layers is not very large and it's mechanically not very large so it can't transmit as much kinetic energy or heat as you can with a traditional via we've got this giant structure which is a plated through hole which is you know much larger than the hdi via and has a lot of good mechanical connections so you get good thermal transfer through the the hole. Um, just another aside, I was in a thermal management class last year, and we talked about the advantages of uh, conductive fill, and I had been a real proponent of that for years, and the consensus was from these experts that it's better instead of drilling a larger hole that you need in order to do the conductive fill, you drill the smallest hole that your fabricator will let you and plate it as full as you can. You get a better thermal conductivity from a plated, small plated via than you do from a larger via that you've paid to have conductive fill in. So if you want to do good thermal management from a power supply <clears throat> or a BGA, you want to use a, a bunch of small vias and plate them, and you don't have to pay extra for the conductive fill works better because the copper is by far a better conductor than the best conductive fill you can pay to put in the hole. So just a quick note. Now, when you look at microvias, they're really small and there's not a lot of thermal mass. What I've, what I've uh, suggested and, and will do when I do HDI board, which I, by the way, avoid like the plague, I will use them in groups of three in order to give myself a larger thermal mass, in order to transmit the heat. And then what I would probably do is, like if I have a signal via, I would put signal one in the middle. I've got three ground vias, and now I've got three parallel 
transmission lines for my power supply. But I would use that to move through the board stack because I need to make a more solid. If two is ground, then that's my first layer of defense to try to get E out of a, out of the BGA, right? So I need to be able to connect as massively as I can the the component that's generating the heat because it's switching and the, the energy is reacting to the molecules in that vice and taking that mechanical energy and delivering it to the ground planes. Now, one other thought about uh, heavier copper, the, the only reasons I would use heavier copper than half ounce or depending on the board step is if I need it for mechanical. If it's there for thermal distribution, yes, heavier copper is better at allowing you to con connect thermally, mechanically to do distribute the heat. But it isn't an, a factor in managing the additional current you need. The only thing that happens when you go to heavier copper is the board can take more abuse before it catches on fire. But the simulation tools, one of the things that make me almost laugh is that you can increase the weight of a copper on the power layer. It doesn't tell you to increase the weight of the copper on the ground. That's like I've got two 18 gauge wires and I need to I need it to be able to try out, you know, conduct 10 amps. So I replace one of the 18 gauge wires with a double lot wire and leave the other one 18 gauges. Have I done anything good here? No, I've not. If I want to be able to carry that much energy, I need a dielectric that will carry that energy. Think about it from that perspective. All right, so we're just about to the end here. I want to just recap some of the things that we're talking about. You've got to always remember the fields travel in the space, not the conductors. The key thing you need to know, and I don't, not always is it on the data sheets, you've got to know how fast the transistors are switching because that frequency is what tells you what you need to know about the wavefront that you're using for the signal itself. Is it switching in 60 picoseconds or is it switching in two nanoseconds? I need to know that. It also tells me what I need to do to feed that part. How close to the capacitor have to be in order to provide good switching energy for the system. So you've got to know how fast the IOs are switching and you need to know what the geometry of the cores are. Is this a 55 nanometer part? Is this a 60 nanometer fin file or is it a five nanometer? How small are those transistors? And that tells you what your considerations are for the power supply. You may not have switching events if the IO is switching in 100 femtoseconds, but you still have transistors in the core that are switching very fast. And it, it tells you whether you really have to be desperate about putting capacitors directly underneath the BGA, connected with as many good parallel paths as you can, or even running into devices that are requiring even more aggressive power supplies where you need to look at placing capacitors on the same layer as the BGA between the balls. Because just that distance, the the 30, the 62 thousandths of a stranded, standard circuit board is a long enough travel time. We're looking at 10 picoseconds round each way. So 20 picosecond round trip, moving the capacitor to the top of the board was required in order to get the part to work properly. That's the level of energy management we're starting to work on. That's why you need to know all these switching geometries because the transistor switching speed is a function of, of two things. One is how hard you're driving the gate, which is obvious or the physical three-dimensional size of that transistor. The other thing, signal and power connections need to be one dielectric from ground the entire link. You need to see continuous conductor, continuous dielectric, switched conductor from the switch back to the supply. 
must be continuous in all three dimensions. And HDI via stacks, you're going to have to use multiple parallel HDI stacks to achieve similar mechanical connection between ICs and the ground planes that you would see automatically with drilled vias. Right, so I've seen both signal integrity problems with the way the capacitors on the bottom of the board were connected to the BGAs on the top, because that was a broken transmission line, didn't follow the connecting of the dielectrics using the ground planes, so they didn't have coplanar ground via, they didn't have uh, via ground via transitions for all the energies, and so they were having problems with uh, EMC related to the switching of the transistors on the IC. Well, that's the way to do it. You've got to think in three dimensions. You've got to remember that the dielectric has to be connected in the z-axis, not just horizontal. Back to the triplets. Again, this is easy stuff. You only need three things to contain field energy. Two conductors separated by a space. You only have three components, conductor, the space, and a switch. There's nothing else in the universe in the electronic world. And you can only do three things with field. You can store it, move it, or convert it to kinetic energy. Like I said, this is not rocket science. We're all just plumbers using very leaky water pipes. We have to design three-dimensional spaces for managing the electromagnetic field needed. I want to take just a moment to thank my three primary mentors, Rick Hartley, who is the first guy who got me to think about fields. I took a two-day signal integrity class at PCD West 15 years ago, and five minutes into that class with Rick, I knew that everything I'd ever designed worked by accident, not on purpose. So from that, I was able to start, luckily, uh, a long-standing friendship with Mr. Hartley, and he's patiently helped me understand this. As a result of meeting Rick, a number of very uh, fortunate events, I was able to meet Ralph Morrison, who is the physicist who set me straight. And uh, I wish I knew more and could have learned more from Ralph while I was alive. He was 94 and a half when he passed away. He was researching quantum physics because he said there's still some things we don't quite understand, and there's a there's some answers here. And he was still driving, he was still playing the violin, active to the very last. Dr. Todd Hubing, who also is probably one of the most prominent individuals in our field. He's uh, an independent uh, contractor now, so if you need a big gun to help you, Todd's your man. But he was a researcher at the University of Missouri, Missouri Rolla, and then he was the endowed chair of the Michelin Automotive Technology Center at Clemson. And now he's uh, he's out there trying to help us understand that Maxwell and Ralph were both right. So I have a reading list that I've attached to this as well that I got from Rick Hartley. Some of these really good books. The one I would suggest if you're going to buy one book would be Ralph's Fast Circuit Boards Energy Management. It was his last book that he wrote. And then the session, the class that he teaches is he's teaching his final book. And, uh, we're, he had never allowed anybody to video him before. I convinced him that he should because the world needed him. And uh, I hired a professional videographer to do the work and then brought uh, Ralph and his wife out to Detroit. We had a captive audience of some of my, uh, my closest customers, and we were able to enjoy the, the teachings that Ralph had. You want to go to a conference, PCB East and West are extremely good places to get uh, good energy. I've got a friend who has a full blown testing lab who's involved in standards. That's Derek Walton. Doug Smith has, he's probably the best troubleshooter on the planet. He's got hundreds of application notes and videos on his website, and he's also an independent consultant. Ken Wyatt's another consultant that I work with. We, the, the three of our other engineers, Derek, Doug, and Ken, 
and I teach at uh, EMC Week once every year. So that's another focused uh, on energy management and, and fields and standards and measurements. The IEEE EMC Society has a lot of great application notes. The Clemson websites as a result of Dr. Hubing's work is there. Recently identified Grand Valley State University because they're working with a consulting firm in that uh, in uh, Western Michigan, and they are graduates from the University of Missouri Rolla, so they they really have their stuff together. And then the IPC as well has a number of things, especially to do with the high density interconnect stuff. So the last slide is this one. It's all about the space. Buildings have walls and halls. People travel in the halls, not the walls. Circuits have traces and spaces. Energy and signals travel in the spaces, not the traces. So I want to thank you for your attention. I'm going to turn off the recording now, um, and then we can see maybe do a little bit of uh, questions and answers. So, Eric, are you there?